Most people know that in America, Christianity has become this consumer thing. You know, you sit down, you find people that you know, and you go and sit there. You know, in rows, and it's dark, and when you worship, it's just you and God. I was used to going to church on Sunday, sit in the back, and not really be a part of the body, and you walk out, and then that's it, that's your Sunday. Uh, we've just kind of assumed if somebody's following bulletins and somebody's a greeter and somebody's stacking chairs that everybody's using their gift. Just even the concept of church that we have, I've always wanted more than that and felt like it should be more than that. We're struggling in different ways. Marriage, um, feeling a little bit isolated. It wasn't flourishing, I, I would say. We weren't flourishing. If they're not finding that in the church, we have to go back to scriptures and go, why not? What are we doing wrong? So many people are going in and out of churches and nobody in their church knows what's happening. One of our elders calls it like pastoral malpractice. Like you're actually ruining people by making them consumers because you're supposed to be turning them into servants. We don't come to be served, we serve and give our lives as a ransom for many. It's at the core of what we understand it means to follow Jesus Christ and we've twisted it, and it's evil. It's really all these things that caused me to just start with a blank piece of paper and just start writing on that paper with scripture and saying, what's most repeated? Uh, what's most emphasized? What does God love most? What does he hate most? What does he command demand of the church and let's pursue those things it's not about having a killer sermon with a great worship set it's about us loving each other well loving Jesus well praying together well uh, studying the scriptures together well and then it's almost like our gatherings are excellent not because there was a ton of prep work done into it but because people are spending time with Jesus people are being led by the Spirit People are loving each other deeply. That's what's going to make our gatherings great. And so it's kind of how we arrived at the new start, I guess. There are mornings where I'm like, oh, I just want to snooze one more time. But you'll like hear the text and you're like, all right, got to get up. start texting each other when we wake up and just encouraging each other with, you know, whatever the Lord's put on our hearts or what we read. And I just am so thankful for the Lord giving me this like, hello, Liz, if you want to be close to me, you got to spend time with me. And since I've been starting to do that, it has changed my walk with the Lord. My walk with God is so personal and I love, I love my time with Him. Like this is success to us when our people love, really love Jesus. Like they don't need all of the bells and whistles, you know, in order to sing or in order to pray or in order to get in the word. We want them to be devoted worshipers of God. So this is where we meet for our house church. Um, and just here in our living room. So we have a few couches, but we have to set up plastic chairs. Uh, everybody's bringing some. Everybody's spending time with Jesus throughout the week. Everybody's um, exercising their gifts. And I encourage people as God highlights a scripture or if a song comes to mind to sing it out or if God's prompting them with a word on their heart to share it. And so it's just beautiful to see every Every, everybody in this room would be feeling the weight of like, I have something to contribute. We wanted these loving families. Like, are we looking around and seeing like these groups of people that really adore one another? I mean, love to the point that Jesus wanted, where the world would look on and go, I've never seen love like this.
I remember getting to Francis and Lisa's house in the evening and I was just thinking in my head like what in the world am I doing like I don't even know these people I was thinking honestly at the time like oh great like I'm moving in with this pastor guy and his family I have like this completely different background <laughs> Like coming out of a life of crime and drug addiction and I'm thinking like, am, are they going to be too straight edge for me? Like, are we going to have to do this like Bible study thing like every day? Is, like, am I not going to be able to be myself? And uh, it, was, it wasn't even like that at all. And it was crazy just to see a godly family. You get to see the good, the bad, and the ugly when you're living with somebody. They didn't have to change anything. They didn't hide anything. It was just living with them. They just accepted me in like, like a family member and just actually seeing Lisa be a godly wife and to be a godly mother. I don't even think she understands how much like she poured into my life just by demonstration. You're not meant to walk out your Christianity alone. Like God never designed it for you to do it by yourself. Like you're supposed to have a body of believers around you, you know? And I didn't know that until I was actually able to um, experience it. The church in my mind and the best I can understand scripture was supposed to be a group of people that loved Jesus. They loved each other deeply because that was his command. This is our true family now. More than a family, we are a body, like one. You are my arm, and so I will protect you, and any hurt to you is a hurt to me. And for there to be this godly leadership that matures this body and strengthens them, disciples them, and sends them out on mission so that we get serious about getting to the rest of the world and making disciples of them. This restaurant it kind of uh, holds a special place in my heart. Um, I, I worked here. This place kind of helped me get my life on track, but it was also the place where I came to know Jesus. I was baptized outside. I was always trying to find joy and putting my hope in like things of the world and drugs, trying to yeah. find pleasure and stuff like that, you know. Coming here, it was like instant, like brotherhood, like this hole I was trying to fill was, could only be filled by God. I remember thinking like all I did to get here was mess up and I heard these guys are pouring into me. This is amazing. I remember like being invited here and then just knowing I'm in my mess, thinking I'm like this dirty person. And then here I am in this prayer meeting around all these like clean people. <laughs> yeah, I remember being really uncomfortable and then feeling like, like looking at these people and be like, man, I want more of this. So I, I kept coming back. Let's say someone comes to my gathering and they're just understanding Jesus, then I find someone that's further along and encourage them to help that newer believer. And so there's just this natural flow of these people who show up that become disciple makers, then become pastors, and then become elders. And then once we've got a few elders, it's like, okay, let's Let's even branch that off and you three elders take those churches, you three elders take those churches and let's just keep it going. So it was nine months in, they talked to me about like, we continue to see the, the Holy Spirit in your life. Do you want to start mentoring? Yeah. And I was like, man, I, I, I don't even have my own life together. How do you expect me to start leading these dudes? And so that idea, you know, like, your, your own sanctification starts to happen when you start, like, pouring into other people. And I, like, that became very real to me. It's like, you know, dude, in the Book of Acts, it talks about how the disciples were, like, uneducated common men, 
but the people seeing that they had the Holy Spirit, like they walked with Jesus, right? And so I read it for myself and I was like, this is me. Like, this is me, an uneducated common dude. And, and I still sit on that verse till this day. A lot of times you think it's like, oh, it's, it's teaching, it's, that's what, like hermeneutics, it's theology, it's this and that, but uh, where you're really gonna get a chance to model Christ is in the way you serve like your brothers. To live in community together, to really demonstrate for people what it looks like to follow Jesus and how that looks in my everyday. And that's where you get sanctified. That's where you're gonna grow in humility. That's where you're gonna grow in patience. Yeah. It's like a two-way relationship and that it's not just the mentors are like these holy spiritual people, but that it can be mutual and that we're growing just as much as they are, maybe in different ways and in different things, but we're still growing. We're still needing more of Jesus every day. I think what's helped me is to reflect on the way that I was led what my sin was like when I first came to know the Lord and how people kind of were patient with me and then try to demonstrate that to others. It's just it's funny like how like God and the universe like will use people like us and add value to our life. It's like here we are just broken, sinful, drug addicts, you know, been to jail, done this or that, outcasts, rejects, people like society doesn't accept anymore. And then Jesus says like, no, like, you have a place in my kingdom, and not only that, but I can use you now. When we're thinking about mission and we're thinking about bringing Jesus um, and Jesus' love to people, it's not this sort of theoretical thing like, all right, I want to love the world, um, but there are 20 houses here, like that will be our mission field. We're going to try to love this block as well as we can. The mandate was just really clear. This house is for the Lord, it's for community, it's for neighbors, it's for welcoming people in. We're not just a community just to be a community, but we are gathering in the name of Jesus, for the name of Jesus, to live this thing called church out daily. This is where we do actually do the house church. So people will be, will be sitting around here. So this building, uh, the people that are in it are pre pretty much um, high tech professionals. So that's what we're trying to do is try to um, outreach specifically to the building here. We committed to having uh, a monthly neighborhood barbecues, we invite everyone from, from these 20 houses out to have lunch with us and then start building relationships where we could go back and check in with folks and, and, and knock on their doors and see if there was something that we could um, help with, something we could pray for or other ways that we could support and love them. And so, yeah, this is not my thing. I'm not a natural hostess. I would much rather in my flesh just have dinners, just our immediate nuclear family. In my flesh, I would not like to clean up after people. And over the years, I think, as we've been part of We Are Church, experiencing it and seeing it in so many of the commandments, it's not you singular. It's to rejoice always, to be generous, to not have greed, um, to love your neighbor as yourself. All those things you can only really practice in community. And so when I came to embrace that, it became this more meaningful communal walk together. To just simply in unity, walking out of our safe house, safe place, going into um, our neighborhood and uh, the intersections and the cities and the coffee shops and talking to the people that live amongst us and work in our neighborhood and you know pray for them and get to know them. So all of the growth in our church since we arrived here has come from people who are in our neighborhood on this block. It's been a real joy for us to, to come and encounter that and, and find people who are not just willing to join us for a service, but actually be a part of our family, um, who are a part of the body of the church that we have here. And increasingly, we see it's indispensable. 
it's just this fellowship is going on and I'm not pushing it. And I felt like with the old model, people aren't going to reach out unless you create a program for them to do it. People aren't going to fellowship with each other unless you create some program for that. People aren't going to get together and pray unless you schedule it for them. Uh, people won't take communion unless you, you know, get all the elements and everything figured out. And now it's just this thing where people are sharing their faith every day. It's just happening. It's natural. They can't help it. Um, and they don't need my permission. The Lord really just confirmed like, yes, I'm asking you to quit your job from corporate America and good money um, and just be obedient. Like Lisa, once asked me like, oh, do you see yourself doing inner city ministry? And I'm like, oh, heck no. And here I am living in the inner city of San Francisco. We've been married for six years, have been fostering and adopting for three and a half of those years. And like, it has been so hard and then so good and then so hard and then so good. And over and over, God would check my heart. It was two weeks before a wedding, we still didn't have a place to live. We were offered free housing, and um, it was outside of the community that we were doing ministry in. And uh, I didn't want to be someone that was coming into the community and then leaving uh, back to a different part of the city. Yeah, so we said no to the free housing in one of the most <laughs> expensive cities in the country. And it was only because we knew we had to be obedient to what the Lord was calling us to. And so over and over again, God would like push me and Sean to the, to the brink and then he'd teach us and he'd mold us into his likeness. And it hurt. <laughs> it hurt so bad sometimes. But every, like even looking back now, I'm like every trial we went through, God has rooted me in the faith that he is good. I mean, people thought it was crazy that we were moving across the street from public housing. Um, but for us, it was like way better than we could have imagined. Yeah, the Lord really like completely changed what I thought my life was going to be. It's like one of those things where you can't even pray for your life to turn out this way. And God just does the writing himself. He took a beating and was put on the cross for us, even when we were sinners. So. That is what we're called to do. <laughs> it's like some, our life, we're going to get a beating. We're going to take a beating. And just recently, God has been like, I love these kids more than you could ever love these kids. So you need to be the hands and feet. You need to show them who I am. It's like, our, look around our group. Are they people who sacrifice and suffer because they so believe in the hope of heaven? Do they see themselves as just travelers on this earth or are they building a home for themselves? Are they these suffering sojourners that just can't wait for the return of Christ? You know, if I say I get up at five in the morning and spend time with the Lord, they go, oh, that's, that's great, you know, but you're Francis Chan, you know? When, when Marcus is doing it at 3.30 in the morning before he goes to work, you know, picking up needles off the street and cleaning off the grossest part of the city and speaking to homeless and caring for them. Or Rob, when you're, you an ex-con tell people like, I can't stop worshiping Jesus like it, I can't get enough, that's huge. And so it's these ordinary people that are so deeply in love with Jesus that they can't help but go and talk about him when they're going door to door in their neighborhoods, not prompted by anyone else, just prompted by a love for their neighbors and a love of Jesus and belief in the gospel. Those have been the most powerful stories to me because it gets rid of all the excuses. You know, it's like, well, if that guy's doing it and he's a doctor and that guy's doing it and he's a thug, What's my excuse why I'm not?